So we started taking uh, Peter's work into uh, the heart of darkness into, into Japan. And, uh, um, and they started looking at that and they said, my God, we've never seen oil and gas modeling like this. And they had, because his oil and gas modeling is like nothing anybody's ever seen. So um, I'm gonna let him talk to you guys. I'm not gonna talk anymore. And what you're gonna hear is probably the most knowledgeable person in the world, in the world, about oil and gas, about what our future is, about geopolitics. Um, uh, just like Dr. Samuelson, this guy's scary smart. And uh, it's not what you're gonna hear tonight, it's what you'll hear in the individual conversations as you talk to him. And if you really wanna know where we're headed and, and what's gonna happen when we get there and go home tonight, and remember, it's, when you slice your wrist, it's this way, you know, not that way. <laughs> so uh, anyway, this is uh, Dr. Wells, and I've known him and loved him for a long time. He's a great guy. <laughs> um, uh, probably best if I just sit down after that. I mean, it's, it can't get any better, can it? Um, I, I was asked to, to speak about the Middle East um, specifically. Um, what are my qualifications for doing so? I've lived in the Middle East probably most of my life. Um, I grew up in the Middle East, so it's, um, it's almost home, not quite. This is a little bit of a story you're gonna get for about half an hour. So, sorry I'm interrupting the dinner, but it's only half an hour. I'm gonna talk about some history, some politics, something about Islam, something about crude oil, something about gas reserves and production. And then I'm going to talk about three countries that we really need to know about. Iran, Iraq, and Saudi Arabia. Now why do we need to know that? Well, showing you what you can see here on the bottom is 2009 and 2020 projection for uh, the proportion of world oil supply, crude oil supply, that's going to come from the Persian Gulf. And this is, this is concentration we're talking about. World oil supply is going to become much more concentrated in the former Soviet Union and the Persian Gulf region in the next 10 years. And in the Persian Gulf region, it's Iran, Iraq, and Saudi Arabia that are going to make up about 75% of that production and rather more of the incremental production. So these three countries are going to be important to us. So now's a little bit of story about early Islam. Why bother with this? You know, why do we need to know this? Because if we want to understand something about these countries in the Middle East and how they worked with each other or don't, we need to know something about how they evolved, where they came from. I'm not going to read all this, but I'm just going to give you the background. Now, the key distinction in Islam is between Sunni Islam and Shia Islam. Sunni Islam, Saudi Arabia, Shia Islam, Iran. That's you know, a good way of remembering this. And the split started over a succession issue. It was the dynastic issue. Some people thought that the, 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 the cousin of Muhammad the prophet, Ali, should be the, the ruler of the Islamic world that had just been conquered. And other people said, no, no, it should be my friend Abu Bakr here. Well, while Ali was burying Muhammad, Abu Bakr took, took, the, took the prize. Ali was a rather sort of quiet guy, so he let that happen. He happened to be married to the favorite daughter of Muhammad, Fatima, and also his favorite grandson, Hussein, very important name to remember, and Hassan. Ali was caliph for a while, but he was assassinated. And he was buried in Najaf in Iraq. Now remember that, it's in Iraq. And most of these people you'll hear about were buried in Iraq. So the succession then passed to someone else called Omar. And he started the Umayyad dynasty, which lasted a long, long time. Uh, the next big event that happened that really, really created Shia Islam was Ali's son Hussein decided, well, you know, some of my friends in Iraq want me to take over. So I'm going to take all my friends over from Mecca and we're going to join up in Iraq and we'll defeat these Umayyads. Well, it didn't work out like that. He, he and his 72 friends were all slaughtered in southern Iraq by the Umayyads. And this death, this martyrdom as they call it, was the defining moment for Shia Islam. And this was the righteous weak against the corrupt mighty. And it's a familiar theme in mythology and religion, and this was the bedrock of Shia Islam. So at this point on, pretty much, 
the government of the Islamic world became Sunni dominated, either from Baghdad or from Cairo, or from Damascus or from Istanbul under the Ottomans. And all these Shia guys got pushed out to the edges. They became sort of mystical and uh, rebellious and it became the religion of the oppressed, it became the religion of the dispossessed, the, you know, the minorities. And they picked up on this idea that at some point in the future, uh, one of the descendants of the Prophet would come back and restore justice and, and goodness to the world. Should be a familiar theme to all of us. This is a kind of mythology. And this is where the 12th Imam came along. Now guess where he disappeared? He disappeared in Samarra. Samarra is in northern Iraq. It's the most northern Shia place in Iraq. And when Al-Qaeda blew up the, his burial mosque in Samarra, they knew exactly what they were doing. They ignited sectarian struggle in Iraq. The Shia said, we've had enough of this. Um, it's your, now it's the Sunni's turn to get hit. So although this history is a thousand years old, it comes back into the modern world quite quickly. The two other interesting things about Shia Islam, first of all, it's mystical. And secondly, it allows interpretation of the Quran, still. And the Sunni Islam, what they call the gates of Ishtihad, the gates of interpretation, closed in the 12th century by the Ottomans. So you can't reinterpret the Quran, it's fixed. Whereas in Shia Islam, you can reinterpret the Quran in modern terms. So you can discuss, well, you know, what should we do with motor cars? What should we do with mobile telephones? Uh, this sort of thing. And the last big event that happened was, you know, why is Iran Shia? How did that happen? Well, in the 16th century, after the Mongols had ravaged the Islamic world, particularly Iran, um, a group of mystical um, Sufis, um, led by a, a rather sort of aggressive, um, non-religious person, formed, founded the Safavid dynasty. Now, the Safavid dynasty was probably the most um, productive period in Iranian history. And they established the state of Iran, as we know it now. And they converted the Sunni population to Shiism. Why did they do that? For politics. They wanted to be different to the Ottomans, different to Arabia. So they converted everyone to Shiism, and they used Arab clerics to do that from Lebanon. At the same time, they gave the Iranian clergy, an institutionalized clergy for the first time in the Shia world, they gave them endowments of property and land, which made them independently wealthy. Well, that came back to bite everyone in 1979, because the clergy had an independent institutions, independent wealth, independent organization, so they could defy the Shah of Iran, and hence the revolution in Iran. So I'm just linking things back and forth here, so you can see history matters. Now, the other thing that happened was, as I said, all these Ali, Hussein, all the Imams, except for a few, are buried in Iraq. So, in Shia terms, that's the holy places to go and visit. So the Iranians gathered all their clerics around these towns of Najaf and Kabbalah and, Kabbala and Khad Khadimir, which is near Baghdad, and they slowly converted all the Arab tribes to Shiism. So southern Iraq became Shia, which is pretty much as it is today. Now, it's an interesting fact that most of the world's Muslims are Sunni. But in the Persian Gulf, most of the Muslims are Shia, which Saudi Arabia doesn't like. So this little map shows the distribution of Sunni and Shia, Sunni in yellow and Shia in green. And this yellow area is the area where Shia Muslims predominate. Bahrain, Lebanon, parts of Turkey, Afghanistan, Bits of Pakistan, all of Iran virtually except for a few pieces, large part of Iraq, and the oil-bearing part of Saudi Arabia. 